Hello everyone, my name is Natasha Porter and I'm so excited to be your teacher today. Make sure you like this video, you comment, let us know that you're here. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel while you're at it. Uh, go share this video with a friend, share it with a family member. Uh, bring in your, your brother or sister from the other room to come watch with you. Bring your parents, bring your kids, all right? Um, even go to our Instagram and go follow us there. Do all the things, right? Um, and then maybe start to get comfortable, maybe get a blanket, right? Maybe get some snacks, you know, because we're going to be here for a little minute. Um, and while you're at it, don't forget your Bible, okay? Because we're going to be reading today. All right, so it has officially been over a year since the start of the pandemic. Can you believe that? And... I notice the more that I talk to people, um, the more I'm on social media, I kind of see how the pandemic has taken a toll on a lot of people's mental health and their mental state, right? And they kind of feel isolated from the world. Um, I've heard a lot of my friends say that they're lonely. You know, you're not really seeing anybody. You're just, you're at home all the time, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there was nowhere to go. There was no one to see. You couldn't go see your friends. You couldn't go see the family member that lived down the street. You didn't want to put anybody at risk. So you were just by yourself a lot of the time, right? And that's kind of dangerous because you're just alone with your thoughts, <laughs> right? And your thoughts can be a little mean, right? Especially those intrusive ones. Uh, they can tell you things you don't really want to hear, maybe make you doubt yourself a little bit. Um, or maybe this was kind of nice for you. It was kind, kind of a nice resting period, right? Um, I know for me, it, it kind of made me a little more anxious, especially after like the two month mark, I was very happy to go back to work because it was like, I, I, I don't know what to do with all this extra energy that I have that I have nowhere to put, right? And so now that it's been over a year, we're finally starting to get some normalcy back. You know, some of the restaurants are starting to open up. Uh, a lot of retailers are opening up. Maybe you're going back to your job or going back to school. And we're finally getting that sense of our normal world again, right? Uh, the only major difference that we're still seeing is the masks. And this may be a difficult transition for some of us, right? Because um, we've probably gotten used to just being home all the time. We've gotten used to going to work in pajamas because we didn't have to go anywhere. We've gotten used to waking up five minutes before class and just rubbing the little boogers out of our eyes and entering our Zoom class, right? And so now we kind of have to relearn how to be a functioning member of society, right? We have to relearn and retrain ourselves to go back into our normal routines. And maybe some of you are learning to merge your pandemic life with our normal life, right? Um, maybe you're not going into the office every day of the week, but you're going Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And Tuesday and Thursday, you get to still do your, wear your pajamas to work. Or maybe you're not going to school full time and some of your classes are still online or you still have that option. Right, And so we're learning to merge these two lives that we've now become used to. And with that merging, may come some new insecurities, right? Uh, maybe you gained a little weight during quarantine. You know, maybe you gained an extra five, 10, 15, maybe 20 pounds, right? And you're, you're learning to adjust to the, the new body, right? Um, or maybe you've gotten really used to going to your meetings or your classes without putting your camera on. So you could go to your meeting with your headscarf on and your bonnet on, and you can wear your pajamas, and you could be snacking your face off, and nobody knows because the camera's off and the mic is muted, right? Or maybe you started to slack in your work right? Maybe you kind of got comfortable and you were like, eh, maybe if I miss this assignment, 
not that big of a deal. My dreidel drop, drop maybe like a point. No big deal. Still a B. Who cares? Or maybe you stopped doing the thing that your boss wanted you to do because it really didn't make a difference. Or maybe you could still complete the project without, <clears throat> excuse me, without doing that thing. Um, and now you're going back into the office and your boss is like, hey, where is where's that, that, that piece of the project that you used to do? And you're like, ooh, I have not done that in over a year, <laughs> right? And so maybe you're doubting yourself a little bit. Maybe your, your confidence is a little shook because you're like, I was in AP Bio before and I did so good and I was so good at testing and now I'm going back to school and maybe you were doing a thing that you weren't supposed to do. I'm not gonna say what it is. And now that you're no longer home and nobody's watching you and you're actually in a classroom and the teacher's walking around, you can't do that thing. Right, so now you're doubting yourself. You're like, oh my goodness, I had the book. I had the book at home. I could have had it open. And now you're in class and you can't do that. Or maybe your boss is breathing down your neck in the office, right? And looking for all, all the little faults you may make because you're, you're not used to doing the Excel spreadsheets the way he used to like it anymore, right? So your, your, your confidence is a little, you're a little like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about this transition. I don't know about this, this change back into my normal life, right? So I want to share a story with you. So maybe my young people might relate to this story a little more than some of the older folk in Israel, right? So anybody that's watching, you probably already know by now that we have our holy days, we have our feasts, we have new moon, we have Sabbath. Right? These are like our cultural basics. Right? As soon as you come into Israel, it's, it's one of your first lessons. Right? We have feasts, you know, we have new moon, we have Sabbath, all these things. And all these things kind of involve some kind of service, which involves prayer. And as children, I don't think we really understand how important prayer is. Or at least we're not paying attention enough to be like, that's important. Right? And when I say prayer, I don't, I don't mean in the movies. When you're, you're watching a movie or a TV show and they go, da -da 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 -da, amen. It is not that. It is not a 10 second prayer. Okay? These prayers are long. All right? These are, these are good, hefty, meaty, five minute, 10 minute prayers. Okay? These, everyone is, is, is really digging deep. What do I need to ask the God of Israel? What, do, what am I looking for in these next seven years of my life? What do I really need in this next month, right? What am I truly, truly grateful for, right? These are some meaty, hefty, heavy prayers, okay? Not, not that 10 second, amen, it's not that, okay? But as a child, you're not paying attention, right? You are thinking about any and everything else, right? You're thinking about all the things you could do after the service is over, or maybe the food you're gonna eat at the feast once the prayer is over, right? You're, you're, you're not paying attention to the words people are saying or how emotional people are when they're praying. You're not paying attention to that. Right? The prayer kind of becomes the thing in between you and the good stuff. Right? It becomes the thing that's in between you and eating the food that Auntie Sophie made. Right? It becomes the thing in between you and watching your favorite TV show that airs that night. It becomes the thing in between you and going home with your mom and baking a cake so you could have sweets after dinner. Right? So you're paying attention to everything else because you're just waiting for it to be over, right? You're thinking about the, the itch you got on your leg. You're thinking about how sweaty your hands are because you're holding auntie's hand and your cousin's hand and you, you've been there for five minutes and you're holding everybody's hand and you're like, oh my goodness, it's so sweaty, ew. 
I just, hurry up, hurry up and finish, right? And as you finally start to get older, you start paying attention a little more, right? Maybe once you get to 10, 11, 12, you're starting to listen, right? You're actively listening now. It's not just mumbles and murmurs that you're hearing in the midst of your thoughts. You're actually paying attention, right? And you're listening to prayers and you're like, oh, that is a fire line. How did they come up with that on the spot? I wish I was so clever. Or you're thinking and you're like, oh my goodness, that is a good thing to pray for. I have a test next week. Let me pray for that. I'll need it. Or you're, you're, you're taking bits and pieces from everyone's prayer, right? You're like, ooh, that's a good thing to pray for. Let me take that. Or let me snatch this thing from that person's prayer. That's a, that's a great thing to pray for. I, I'm going to need that, right? And you pay closer attention, and, and it helps you craft your prayers, right? And it helps you determine what things that you want and what things that you, you need to start praying for because these are things that will soon apply to you, right? And I'll never forget one day we were having some service, and my brother was praying. Now, I'm very close with my brother. Um, we, we grew up very close. Um, we're, we're fairly close in age, and I remember being younger, and even still now, I, I, I always wanted to be like him, and I admired him so much. And it wasn't necessarily a, a be like him because I wanted to walk in his footsteps and do all the things that he did, because it, it wasn't really that, but it was more so I, I admired his mind and the way he thought and how humble he was. And when he would make a mistake, he would tell me. And in hopes that I wouldn't repeat that same mistake and that I could learn from him, right? And I, and I loved that about him. And I loved the way that he, he thought. And he, did, he made an effort to not think selfishly, right? And all these things about him I really loved. So I'm listening to his prayer, right? And he asked for confidence in the God of Israel. And I'm listening to his prayer, and he goes, God of Israel, give me confidence in you. And that, that stuck with me. And it wasn't really a new message I was getting, right? It's, it's the same message. It's the same thing, essentially, as saying, have faith. And it's the same thing as saying you trust in the God of Israel. And it's the same thing as saying don't doubt, right? But for whatever reason, you know when you, you hear something and, and whoever it is, you may have heard this message a million times. Your mother told you the same thing. Your best friend told you the same thing. And then eventually <clears throat> you hear from your brother or you hear from a stranger. The same message, maybe packaged a little differently, but the same message essentially, and that's when you hear it. And that's when you're ready to receive that message. And that's when you really listen and you're like, that is what I needed to hear. And so when he said that, for whatever reason, him packaging having faith in the God of Israel and trusting in the God of Israel as having confidence in him, that stuck with me. And I still pray about that to this day. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you, I'm a very anxious person. Um, and it's not my favorite trait about myself. Uh, honestly, I, I wish I could go through life being, you know, the chill person that's just like, ah, whatever happens, happens. I'm not that person, right? I worry a lot. Um, and my mom used to work a lot when I was younger. And so naturally when she was at work and, and being home with my brothers, I would kind of assume the motherly role in the house. And I would make sure that if it was my brother's turn to do the dishes, that the dishes were done. 
And if for whatever reason he didn't get to it, I made sure I did it so that my mom didn't have to come home to it. Or if my brothers had chores to do, homework to finish, needed to take a shower, whatever it was, I made sure everything was done, right? Because I wasn't trying to add more stress onto my mom's plate, so I took on the worry, right? And maybe that's because I'm the only girl of four boys. Um, maybe that's because I'm a cancer. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I worry a lot, like my whole life, since I was young, since I can remember. And Elder has this quote, and I, I'm probably not going to say it exactly the way he says it. He's a very eloquent man. Um, he says, expect the worst and hope for the best and let the God of Israel handle the rest. And I so badly wanted to adopt that ideal into my life. And when I heard it, I was like, that sounds amazing. Absolutely. That's exactly what I should do. Ex expect the worst, hope for the best, let the God of your handle the rest. Easy. Done. Right? But I just, I couldn't do that because I worry. Right? I'm very anxious. I worry. I, I, I'm the type of person that has to plan everything, right? Um, if you can't call me and be, hey, I want to go to Florida this weekend. No, that's not how it works. I need two weeks notice, okay? I need to know who's going to be there, who was invited and probably won't come just in case they do come. I need to know who wasn't invited but somehow find out about the plans and might come anyways, even though they know that they weren't invited. I need to know what restaurants we could go to, what's Sabbath friendly to eat just in case. I need, I need all the information. When I'm going to the restaurant, I need to see the menu beforehand. And I need to go through everything, find a safe option, right? Something that they can't possibly make unclean, right? And I have to be like, okay, I'll get this. And if there's pictures, I will find them because I want to know exactly what to expect when I sit down at that table and I order my meal, I want to know exactly what's gonna land in front of me. I am that person, right? I am the person that overthinks, right? I'll, I'll sit there and I'll be like, okay, this thing is gonna happen and it could either go A or B. And kind of like um, those choose your adventure games or the, those story games that they have. And I'll be like, okay, this it will go up to this point, and then I have A and B. So let's see if I choose A, then I'll go this far, and then I'll have my next A and B. And then I'll choose B. I'll choose B, right? And then I'll get three options the next time, and then maybe, and I'll go through every single one of those options, right? And I will meticulously go through every outcome that could possibly happen, because I, I need to be prepared. If anything happens, anything goes wrong, I need to know what I'm going to do next. Even if everything goes perfectly smoothly, I just need to be prepared for it. So it's, it's very easy to say, let the God of Israel handle it. It's in the God of Israel's hands. But especially for me, I don't know about you guys, but it is so hard for me to apply that to my life and to really be the, I did what I can, and now it's up to the God of Israel. It's up to his will what will happen. I, I try, and I, I'm still working on it. I've gotten a little bit better. I'm still working on it, though. Okay? So I say all of that to say that I want to speak to you today about having confidence in the God of Israel and having confidence in his will and having faith and trusting in him. Right? So let's open up our Bibles to Daniel 6. And I'll give you guys a second to get there. Okay? So what's happening, right? It's very important that when you're reading the Bible that you have context, right? You don't want to just open up the Bible and just start reading. You don't know who's talking. You don't know who they're talking to. You don't know what time it is. Uh, you don't know where Israel is at. You need context, right? So right now, uh, Darius is over Babylon in Daniel 6, okay? And he put 120 princes and three presidents over the whole kingdom, okay? And of those three presidents is Daniel, and he's the first president, right? And that's because he had an excellent spirit, right? When you read about it, it says because he had an excellent spirit 
spirit was in him. Okay? And the presidents and the princes, they just weren't having it, right? You know, the way your light shines as an Israelite, people just can't handle it. They're jealous, right? They're jealous of you. There's something about you, and I'm jealous. I don't like it. I have to knock you down off your pedestal. I have to find some kind of fault in you so that your light is just a little bit dimmer, right? And so they're plotting against Daniel, and they're trying to figure out where can we find fault in him? Where can we find something wrong, something that, that will force the king to do something, right? And so they made a decree that said that they can only serve the king. And if anyone made any petition and went and served any other god or any other man, that they would be thrown into a lion's den. Now, I don't know about you, but the way my survival instincts are set up, ain't no way. Ain't no way. Okay? A lion's den, everything is happening in secrecy. Okay? I will go into the basement to do my prayer and serve my God and let it be that. Ain't nobody finding out. I'm not telling nobody. Okay? I'm trying to live. I'm trying to live to serve my God. Okay? All right. So let's go to Daniel 6. And let's go to verse 10, okay? And if you guys got your Bibles at the beginning, you should already be there. All right, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew, okay, this wasn't, they didn't go and do this in secrecy. Daniel knew what was going on. He knew that there was a decree signed. He knew what was going on. He knew what was just made law. He went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. What did I just say? Ain't nobody knowing that I'm praying. I'm trying to live. And Daniel is out here, this man is proud. He's very proud and very brave. I'll say that. Because if I was Daniel, I would have at least closed the windows. Maybe draw the blinds, lock the door. I don't want anybody to see me because I'm not trying to end up in this lion's den. I'm not trying to die because any smart person is thinking, I end up in a lion's den. The lions are going to be so nice to me. They're going to be chill. We're going to be best buddies. No. No. They're going to eat you. They are going to eat you. What lion do you know that is not Simba? That is nice. Come on. Verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So they saw him. They saw him. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not, which altereth, altereth not, which means it's not changing. It's not changing for nobody, right? So they go and tell the king, and they're kind of like the, the annoying kids on the playground, right? Where you're playing, you're playing tag, right? And maybe you, you tag one of the princes and they slip and fall bruise their knee, right? So they go run to the teacher. Daniel pushed me. Look at my knee. It's Daniel's fault. I, I was just playing tag. I was just living my life. And now y'all over here trying to blame me for, for just playing the game. They're those kids, okay? And the king was very, very, very upset with himself when he found out that Daniel was serving his God. 
It says that he was sore displeased with himself in verse 14. Was sore displeased. And it goes on to say, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, that he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king was distraught because he loved Daniel. Why? Because he had that spirit, right? He had that fire in him. There was something about him. Because he was an Israelite, he had that light. And he was favored in the king's sight. And now look, look what you as the king have done because you set this into law. Oh, that must hurt. That must really hurt. Because now somebody you love and adore so much is getting hurt because of something you did. But you are the king. So you can't just go back on your word. How does that look? How does that look to all the people that serve you? To be like, oh, but it's, it's Daniel, guys. It's Daniel. I love him. Because now everybody's going to go around thinking, the king's a softy. He'll let anybody do anything. These laws mean nothing. They mean nothing. I'm just going to go do what I want. He'll probably let me go anyways, if, if he finds out. You can't do that as the king. You have to be powerful. You have to establish this, this, this fear, right? You want people to fear you a little bit. Because you want to make sure when you sign the law, that nobody's going around acting foolish, right? Okay, let's, let's go down to, to 16. We're going down to verse 16. Remember, we're in Daniel 6. Let's go down to verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went into his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. You know when you're having a good night's sleep? I know my mom. My mom, she went through a long time where she slept with music, right? And it's peaceful, right? Because you want to be peaceful when you go to sleep. You're relaxing. You're resting. You're turning your brain off for the next six, eight hours, right? King couldn't do that. Because Daniel is in the lion's den because of him. And now it's, now it's the king's fault because you signed the law, you signed the decree into law. And now you're so distraught that you can't even get a peaceful night's sleep. You know, I, I, I personally love a uh, midnight snack, especially when I get home late from work. I've already eaten dinner. Maybe I'll have a piece of chocolate or some fruits. The king fasted. I'm sure the king could have had a midnight snack if he wanted to. But he was fasting because he was so distraught with himself because of what he did. 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning. You see, he was, he was determined to go and see what happened. There was no waiting. And went in haste unto the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. Is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Now, to be dramatic, I would have paused if I was Daniel, to be honest, uh, just, to, just to see him, see if he would have cried a little bit more. And then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not heard me, hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, 
And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So he was fine. He was chilling. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he, read it with me, because he believed, because he believed in his God. Because why? Because he believed in his God. He had the confidence. I'd, I'd like to think that he was like, if it's God's will for me to die, then so be it. And if not, that'll be great. I live another day to serve my God. Because as long as you're doing the right thing, I know we ask a lot for the God of Israel not to forsake us. As long as you're doing the right thing, whatever God's will may be, Ultimately, there is some purpose, right? Ultimately, something good has to come of it. You may not see it, or maybe you will. But ultimately, there is a, there is a reason. But luckily for Daniel, he, he got to live. Being in a den with lions, he got to live. So when I think about this story, I kind of think, how much of the Bible you have to, to get through to, to get to this story, right? And it's, it's easier to have that confidence when you kind of, you see everything that's gone on, right? The God of Israel has a resume with us at this point, right? We've, we've seen all his wondrous works. We've seen, you know, the covenant and the promise be made. We've seen the God of Israel bring us out of Egypt. We, he has a resume, right? It's, 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 a, it's a few stack of pages, right? And by this point, we've, we've seen what the God of Israel can do. So it's easier to put our trust in him. It's easier to, to have that faith, right? It's, it's kind of like doing a, an experiment. So... You've done the same experiment over and over again, and you've gotten the same result. So chances are, if you're asked to do the experiment one more time, you'll get the same result, right? And maybe you change a factor, too. Maybe you're not in captivity in Babylon, but it's Egypt. Maybe you're not going into the lion's den, but it's a fiery furnace. But it's still the same result. Ultimately, we put our trust in the God of Israel and we come out prosperous. But what happens when it's the first time that you do the experiment? You get, you get the experiment packet. I don't know if, if you guys still do this in school, but you get the experiment packet and you, you have to lay out your hypothesis, you get the procedure, you know, and then you have to make some conclusion. You have to, to, to guess, you know, what you think is going to happen. And that's going to be your, your hypothesis, right? And you don't know what the result of the experiment is going to be, right? You see the procedure. You know the steps. You know what you're supposed to do. But you don't know the outcome. So maybe your hypothesis is right. Or maybe it's wrong. And depending on what story this is, that could be good or bad. And so when I think about the first time, my immediate thought is Abraham. So let's turn to Genesis 22. So again, we don't just read the Bible and open up a page and start reading. We need context, right? So what's happening? What's going on? So at this point, Abraham has left his family. He has, he's met with the God of Israel, left his family in Ur, and, you know, he's left everything behind to, to go and serve the God of Israel, right? And his wife, Sarah, is barren. He can't have kids. And at this point, he's an old man. He's an old man. When I picture him, his, his shoulders are kind of hunched like this, right? 
Maybe he got a, a nice beard going for himself, right? Uh, I always picture a staff, I don't know why, maybe to help him walk. You know, he's an old man. And Sarah is an old woman. She's been barren her whole life, right? It's just the two of them, okay? And right before this, they finally, finally, the God of Israel blesses him with a son, right? In their old age, they finally get a son, Isaac. And it's, it's part of the promise, right? Because the God of Israel promises Abraham that his seed is going to be like the sand of the earth. And you're like, okay, I finally have a son. Now my, my lineage and my line can go through my son, right? And I know dads are, are very proud of their, of their boys, right? So I can imagine how Abraham felt in his old age, thinking he's never going to have children. And he finally has a child, and it's a boy. It's a son. Somebody could carry on his name, right? So let's, let's get into this. Let's, let's start reading. Okay, we're going to read from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. We're going to stop right there. <laughs> Ain't no way. Ain't no way. In my old age, I finally have my son. You promised me that I was going to have seed like the sand of the earth and I have my one son my only son who I love so much who I'm so proud to have in my old age and you want me to go offer him for a burnt offering are you mad are you joking me at, at this point I would have been like you know what I don't know if this relationship is going to work for God of Israel I don't know because he doesn't, he doesn't have a resume at this point. Right now, all, all he has is, is that he promised that Abraham would have seed like the sand of the earth, right? And now he has Isaac. And he's like, okay, promise fulfilled. Okay, I can, he's going to eventually get married, have children. They'll have children. And they'll have children, right? And now you're telling me to go kill the only child I have. So, so you're... Essentially, re removing your promise. You're redacting your statement. How does that work? How does that make sense? And I'm just supposed to be okay with that? You promised. And now you're taking it back? I don't understand. I, I would, I'm sorry. The, the promise was fulfilled, so I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to go about my merry way. And then in verse 3, it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass. What? Where is the questioning? Where is the this God that came to me, told me to leave my whole family? My, me and my wife have been barren for all these years in my old age. I finally have a son, and now you want me to go kill my son? Where is that? Abraham rose up early in the morning. It couldn't be me. Let's be honest. And you know, as a child, we would read this story, right, when I was younger. And I was very competitive, <laughs> okay? I was a very competitive child. Before I, I understood, I was like, oh, this is, this is not a good thing. Abraham would feel bad. I should feel bad, you know? I was like, oh, I could do it. No big deal. I just met him. It's fine. And then I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, maybe that. And now I'm a mother. There is no way that I'm doing that. After you promised. So let's keep going. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. 
Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, if I wasn't going home before, if my child looks up at me like, Where, Daddy, where's the lamb? And I know, I know, I know that it's my son. Now we really turn it back. Look, look, he looked at me with his eyes, with his eyes. Imagine. Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. So they went both of them together. I'm not even going to say anything. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. This poor child is traumatized. Oh my goodness. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. By then my, my waterfalls, waterfalls. Oh my, oh my goodness. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, that kind of confidence and faith is out of this world. And it's faith in, in God's will, right? And it kind of goes hand in hand with faith and fear and trust and confidence. Those all kind of go hand in hand together, right? And Abraham had it. He had it. And I, I can't tell you how... Abraham felt I can't I don't know I can only tell you how I would feel and I probably wouldn't have gotten that far I probably wouldn't have passed that test and sometimes we have to think about having faith and having confidence even when things don't work out in the way that we want right and you can't just have faith and confidence when things do work out, right? You can't just pray for something and pray and pray and pray, and then because that thing isn't happening, now you've lost all your faith. It doesn't work that way, right? Y you have to keep your faith and confidence even when the things don't work out, even when you've, you've been praying for this thing for years and it's still not happening for you, right? And a lot of times it's because we can't see the full picture. That's above us. We don't know what the full picture is. We, we, we have what's in this book, and we have what's, what's prophesied, but we can't see the big picture. It's kind of like we, we see the little picture. We see a glimpse, right? We, we, we get a little bit, right? The God of Israel shows us just a little bit. And... It's kind of like, have you ever seen those commercials where um, it's a little picture, or maybe even art, where it's a little picture and then you zoom out and all of these little pictures make the big picture. It's kind of like that. The God of Israel has the big picture. 
but we just get the one piece, right? So that kind of confidence, I don't know where Abraham got it, but at least now it, it, it has to be learned, right? Like how fear is, is a learned behavior. You, you learn from your parents to be afraid of heights because they go on a building that's super high. I remember when I was young, me and my mom went into this building. I can't even remember what the building was, but the, the, the top floor, the ground was glass. And we go and I see my mom is scared, and so I'm scared, right? So like how fear is learned, confidence is learned, right? You know, a parent, you grow up in a, in a household with a parent that is like, you can do it, you got this, I'm here. If anything happens, kind of like when you're, you're learning to ride your bike, right? And they'll, they'll hold on for a while, you get the train and wheels and all that stuff. And eventually they gotta let go, right? but they, they instill all this confidence in you that by the time you realize they've let go, like you're already gone, you're zooming, right? So, so confidence is a, is a learned thing. And it's not something you learn and then you get to the point and then you're good to go. It's something you, you keep relearning, you keep getting tested on, right? There's, there's so many times in my own life where I could be like, I prayed for this thing, I got it, and I, I expressed all my gratitude to the God of Israel. I was so happy, I was so content, and then I prayed for this next thing, and as I'm praying for the next thing, I'm still worried if this prayer is even gonna get answered. When I have no reason to be questioning, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, if I'm keeping my holy days, if I'm you know, being a good brethren, if I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do as an Israelite, why would I question him? Because if I, I put in my work, the God of Israel would do the same. He's not gonna forsake us, right? And maybe the outcome is not gonna be what you want, right? Because maybe the God of Israel is protecting you from something that could potentially hurt you or something that's not gonna be good for you in the long run, right? Maybe the God of Israel is protecting you and you're, you're not always gonna be happy with that outcome, but that doesn't mean that you start to doubt or that you start to question him or you lose your confidence in the God of Israel, right? Because ultimately, things will work out. Again, you may not see it, but maybe your children will. Maybe your children's children will. Ultimately, things will work out if it is God's will. And if you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're keeping the laws, you're keeping the statutes and commandments, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you shouldn't question, right? So when we look at the Bible, stop looking at it like it's a collection of stories. This isn't some book you pull, pull off your bookshelf and you sit and you have a cup of tea and, and you read it. Maybe you're eating some bread and cheese and enjoying it and you get lost in this fantasy world, right? This is not that book. You don't get to close this book and then the story no longer applies. This is your history. This book is for you. This book applies to your everyday life. This is not a book that you open, enjoy, close, and move on with your life. This, it's, it's our confirmation, right? It's our confirmation that if we put in the work, right? Daniel is praying and, and keeping his part of the deal to the God of Israel and serving his God, that the, the God of Israel will put in his part. He'll deliver you from the lion's den. This is our confirmation, right? And you have so many examples. I could, I could open this book to any page and give you an example. I could talk about Esther going in before the king when everybody knows that you do not go to the king unless you are called to, for. You do not do that. 
Or I could go and talk about Job and how his whole life he gets tested and he never loses that confidence and that faith he has in the God of Israel. Or I could talk about Joseph and how he gets locked in prison and his brothers sell him and all these horrible things happen to him and he still ends up second in command in Egypt. Or I could tell you how when you doubt and when you lose that faith and when you lose that trust, what happens? It's your downfall. Because if you think about it, when Israel is in the wilderness, that lack of confidence that they have is ultimately their downfall. It's ultimately the thing that ends up killing that generation, right? So now is, is not the time to lose your faith. Now is not the time to doubt. Now is not the time to, to question, right? Now is the time to build your faith. Now is the time to build that confidence, to build that relationship that you have with the God of Israel, to work at it, right? Now is that time. And it's not like you, you're not already seeing it. I'm here standing before you today. I woke up this morning. I had a nice breakfast, right? I'm here today to teach you. I'm here today to, to remind myself. And just like you woke up this morning to even be able to watch me today, whether you're on your couch, in your bed, at work, maybe in your free period at school, we've made it this far. So why are you doubting? Why are you questioning? Now is not the time. You don't want to make it out of Egypt only to die before you can even get to the promised land because you didn't have confidence in your God. I want to thank you all for your time today. Peace. Bow down, die, and arrow, Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, save thy servant that trusted in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, thou lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are thy any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought, sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thy handmaid. Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may see it, and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, has hope in me and comforted me. Selah and Selah. Amen. Welcome, 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 brethren and guests. And I want to thank you, Natasha Porter, for that excellent, excellent lesson on the confidence of the God of Israel. Just thinking about that, confidence in the God of Israel. What power that holds when we can say confidence in the God of Israel. You know, recently we go around, you know, we have conversations with bunch of different people, and everybody has their take or their opinion about the God of this Bible, right? There's always some, some saying they go with that they've heard a long time ago, right? My God will love me thick and thin through, through everything, trials and tribulations, right? But there's a question I want to ask. That's, that's just something that really has been on my mind, right? Everyone has confidence in the God of this Bible. Everyone loves the God of this Bible. 
But does the God of this Bible have confidence in you? Think about that. Does the God of this Bible have confidence in you? And what is the criteria for the God of Israel to have confidence in you? Really something I want, I want us to really think about and really let that sink in a bit. What is that confidence? Why should the God of Israel have confidence in us? Something I really want us to really just dive into. So recently, we took a trip down to Tulsa, Oklahoma. A lot of you might know this is the place of what's considered Black Wall Street, or what was Black Wall Street. And we met a lot of interesting people, a lot of, a lot of folklore, a lot of you know, excitement, because this year happens to be the 100th centennial since the race riot. And one of their proud accomplishments and moments was, hey, did you know Black Wall Street had over 40 churches? 40 churches, 40 shrines. Think about that. Over 40 shrines. And we had to stop and kind of kind of ask each other, considering the history of how Tulsa came to be. So you had a man, a black man, who went, I'm sorry, a Jacobite. You had a Jacobite who went and went to native, the native of, of this land and purchased 40 acres and said, hey, this land, only for Jacobites. So at what point did it dawn on them to say, hey, let's build some churches. Let's build some shrines. What spirit are you trying to have? What confidence is that? How can you have confidence in a spirit and a God that has brutalized you? How can you have confidence in the feet of the abuser? So much so that you want to build your city up with that same spirit. And then ask the question of why was it destroyed? Does that make sense? Is that something we really try to comprehend? That even in today's day and age, we're still using that same spirit to try to build ourselves up and at the same time tell our abusers to take your feet off our neck. Definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's one of those things that is just, it's, it's so mind-blowing when we really sit and think about just that process of what that means. Literally, they're shooting and killing us in the street. But come Sunday morning, we're sitting right next to them saying, yes, praise your God. Yes, I love your God. The one that has, the one that brought me over here is chained and shackled in the belly of ships. Yes, praise your God. The one who raped my ancestors. Praise your God. The ones who repeatedly have taken our children away from us. The ones who repeatedly have separated us, have cast us away. And we constantly say, hey, praise your God on Sunday morning. But, and we ask them to, to remember, does my black life matter? Again, definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. But it's not so much blameless because everyone has to answer for their own life, right? But I like to look at it from the standpoint of, okay, these people just really don't know who they are. This is the only c conclusion I can come to that makes someone praise an abuser. It's almost like Stockholm Syndrome. We just can't, we can't leave them alone. We cannot throw away their gods. We have to, we wear it around our neck. We put it on our clothes, on our shoes. We, we tattoo it on our bodies. We, we wear it every single day and we're proud. We're proud to praise that God. We're proud to stand up and say, yes, that is my God. But when it comes to our God, when it comes to the one true living God, the God of our fathers, well, wait a minute now. Hey, I don't know about that God. That God has to do something for me in order for me 
to want to praise and worship their God. Think about that for a second. We require so much of our God, but the God of our abusers, we require so little. So little. Just, just leave me be. Just allow me to go to work in the morning, not be pulled over, not be harassed. But when it comes to the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, we say, wait a minute. I need you to give me the world. Otherwise, I can't serve you. I need you to, to shower me with gifts and raiment of everything. Otherwise, this is not a God that I want to serve. So going back to who are we? And I see people a lot of times refer to themselves as African-American, black, Egyptians, Kemet, Hebrew Israelite. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. But how can you have confidence in yourself if you don't know who you are? How can you have confidence in your God if you have no idea who you are or what path to take? Because when we start to name ourselves, when we start to take on that identity of those, of, of those enslavers, of those abusers, now, we, now we're lost spiritually. Now we start, to, we start to do things like we go out and we create our own gods. We start pulling our God from the sky. We start following other nations and serving their gods and, and, and worshiping their gods. And then we turn around and say, why won't they just leave us alone? Something's wrong with this picture. Something is seriously, seriously wrong with this picture. And, you know, our children today, it's one of those things where, and I think, you know, every year, it's always like I hear people say, I wish we can go back to the good old days. And, I, and I'm often left wondering, what, what are the good old days? At what point of the 400 years is a good old day? And what year, what, what year did we not suffer abuse? What year did we not suffer racial inequality? So what good old days are we possibly referring to in this country, in this land, this land of captivity? Again, insanity. <laughs> insanity, that's taking on the mindset of, of our enslavers. That's taking on the characteristics of our enslavers to, to, to get us to see and believe and to think that, yeah, that was a good old day. For them, absolutely it was a good old day. It's still good old days for them. Because they still can do whatever they want to us. We're still fighting for the same thing we've been fighting for since we first arrived here on the belly of the ships. Just allow me to please have peace. Allow, allow me to just go home to my family. Allow me to raise my family. And over and over and over again, we see that abuse come our way. Again, one of those things that just, it's just, ah, it just, it drives you crazy when you think about it. Because it's like, just understand who you are. Just really try to understand who you are. And who are we? Who are we, right? Now, brethren, we all, we're all familiar. We understand that we are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. But what does that really mean to those people who say, who, who are they? Who Who's Abraham, who's Isaac, and who's Jacob? Who are these people that we're descendants of? And what, and what does it have to do with our God? What does that really have to do with our God? So, like my speaker before me said, I hope you have your Bibles handy. So, if you will, let's turn to Genesis chapter 17. I'm going to start at verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am, the, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is, is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. 
Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. And I want to read that again. An everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Wow. So when we ask, who are we the descendants of? And why is this God so important to me? We see why our God is so important to us. So long ago, the foundation was set. So long ago was our hope already set. That if you serve me, if you have confidence in me, I will be your God and you will be my people. Wow. In, in the years where we have struggled with an identity, in the years where we have asked ourselves over and over and over again, who are we? Are we Africans? Are we, are, are we black? Are we Jamaican? Are we just so many different nationalities pop into our mind? Even I've even heard that oh, we are Native Americans and the slave trade never happened. This is a true, this is a true concept out there. This is how lost and damaged we are as a people. Again, we start pulling and plucking from everywhere trying to fit in. But we see here who we are. We see what our covenant is, what that contract is. That all male children shall be circumcised. And this is an everlasting covenant. There is no end to this covenant. This isn't something that happened so long ago, so it's, not, it's no longer relevant. Even to this day, this is relevant for us. Even to this day. This is how we establish ourselves when we separate ourselves and say, what makes us so special? This is a covenant that we have with our God. Sorry, I need to take a quick sip of some water. When we talk about being the children of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, a chosen seed. Well, I like to look at it as a chosen well, if you will. We're a chosen well unto the God of Israel. We were set up to be a chosen well to the God of Israel for him to go to that well to pull us when he needs us. To dip into that well to, to utilize us as he sees fit. And for us, he replenishes that well. He's the source for that well. But we are that well nonetheless. Now, any other source is what you would consider a GMO. This is not supposed to be here. There is no other source, no other source that the God of Israel will go to but his children. So when you get, when you see those discussions about who was who the people, who, what is this about, what is that about, lies, all lies, all lies. This is not a God of the world. He doesn't deal with the world. He only ever deals with his children. And he only ever taps into that source that is his children. Whenever there's something that needs to be done. Now, sometimes that world may get a little dirty and the confidence may wane a little bit. But the world is the source nonetheless. Because you know how we are. You know how we get, we get lost in our own, our own thoughts, right? Our own hearts, right? We want to serve the God of Israel according to our own understanding. We want him to understand our shortcomings, right? But then we pray, and we want the answer right away. And he's like, hey, you know I'm messed up, man. You know I'm, I'm, I'm doing things I know I'm not supposed to be doing, but hey, I, my, my rent is due Thursday. Hey, I need some help now. God of Israel, can you please just, just, just bless me so I can get this rent? 
But when it came to learning, when it came to understanding, when it came to edifying ourselves, we're not present. We're not there. Again, as the previous speaker talked about, we, we start to make all these different decisions and put everything in front of that prayer. Almost like, almost as if it becomes a chore. Can you imagine? We, we are the one people that have the source to talk to the one true living God. And we have to make an appointment to talk to our God. We have to schedule time where after I get through watching this TV show, where after I get through doing whatever I'm doing, after I go to this sports event, after I do whatever it is I'm doing, then I'll pray to my God. And again, we want instant gratification. Woe are people. Woe indeed are people. Again, this is how lost we truly are. But there was a time. There was a time we were a functioning nation, or at least trying to achieve that goal to be a functioning nation. And, you know, the one thing about confidence, right, it's one of those things where when it's there, it's, mm, no one can tell you anything different. No one can tell you anything different. You know what it is you're doing. You set the stage, everything is set up right. I imagine this, this is the God of Israel. We come out of the wilderness. The stage is set. Everything is set up for us. Hey, just go. I have confidence in you guys. Just go and do the task that's at hand because I've already handled the rest. Everything was already took care of. Now, we're going to jump into a story real quick just to, just to kind of really further elaborate on this point, right? So, I know we still have our Bibles, right? So, if you will, please turn to Numbers 13. So I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit, but I urge you, urge you to always read the entire chapter for full context and for understanding. Now, again, come out of the, come out of the land of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, great jubilee, great jubilee, right? And we're familiar with the story, how we start to go worship a golden calf and instantly get off the path, instantly get off the path. It reminded me so much when we were in Tulsa how... <laughs> They gain their freedom, 1865, 1907, they're given land, and then they go and build these shrines, right? When we talked about the, seeing our characteristics in the Bible, we see it clearly, clearly. Because even with freedom, even with, even with what we were facing, we still went to go serve their gods. Now, they're traveling, they go, they, they, now they're going to go spy out the land, right? So I'll begin verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. I just want to stop right just for a second. Again, can you imagine? This is the God of gods. And he's talking to us. That's huge. This is the God of gods, spirit of spirits, that's having a conversation with Moses and giving Moses instruction. That should not be minimized. No other nation can make that claim. That should never be minimized. Our God talked to us. Not in the concept where you see today where people say, God spoke to me. I saw $20 on the ground and God told me to take that $20. Not in that concept, not at all, because we know that's, that's, that's false, absolutely false. But our God spoke to us to give us instruction. Please don't ever downplay that. Don't ever wash it and push it to the side as if it's just something that happens every single day. This is the closeness that our God had, the confidence that he had in us to give us that instruction, to know that, hey, I'm going to tell you to do something, you're going to go do it. So, again, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but I urge you when you have the time and opportunity to really read through the whole chapter. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 27. And they told him and said, this is after the spies came back, 
And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched out, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of, of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Hmm. Hmm. Can you imagine? So just let's just paint a picture. Can you imagine? You 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 know, for those of us who have children, right? We set a stage up. We prepare our children for life, right? Whether we, whether that's investing into their future, do education, whatever it is, we put that investment in there. And we make sure we do everything in our power to make sure they're secure and we're going to take care of them. And they turn around and say, I can't do it. I can't do it. When you know you have sacrificed so much in order for them to get to that point. But their, their response is, not so. We can't do it. How would you feel? How would you really, really feel? Again, we know we take our God for granted. We, we, we ask him of petty, silly matters. But when he what he requires of us, we put it, we, we put it as this is big bowl that we have to carry down the street, that we're not capable of doing it, even though he already set the stage and the foundation for us to do so. Now, we have to know as a nation, everything we do, one of us affects all of us. There's no such thing as I'm going to go over here and live my life to do things according a certain way, and it's okay, I'm over here by myself. Doesn't work that way. That's not Israel. Never has been Israel, never will be Israel. Even so, let's continue reading to see what that, what that effect was. What was the outcome of this evil report? So I'm going to go to chapter 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would God we have died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. How, how do you, oh my goodness. How was that a thought process? You just escaped hard bondage. You just saw the miracle of the Red Sea. You saw all these plagues befall all these plagues befall the Egyptians. And constantly the number one thing on your mind is, let's just return to Egypt. So much so, let us pick a captain to lead us to return back to Egypt. Where's the confidence? Where's the confidence? Again, no small matter. The Red Sea party, you walked on dry land. The Egyptian army was killed. But you still put your confidence inside this nation with strange gods? Look at what your God did for you to rescue you, to pull you out after he heard your cries. After he saw the abuse you were dealing with. 
it tugged at him to the point of, yes, let me go and raise up my servant Moses to go and rescue my children. And again, just to go and to subdue the land. And we bring back this evil report. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where you just, all you can do is really shake your head. This, this people, us, us, this is us doing this. This isn't some, some far off people. This isn't something we look at and just be like, I wouldn't have did that. We do this to this very day. To this very day we do this. Again, I'll continue on. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephun, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of their land, for they are as for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Wow. Wow, the passion they spoke. You can imagine the passion they spoke after hearing that evil report. No, our God has delighted in us. Our God will rescue us. He will see fit that we go and subdue this land. It's an exceedingly good land. We're out here in the wilderness. We're in the wilderness. And we're content with standing in the wilderness versus going to subdue this land so much so that we want to return back to Egypt? Again, this people, this people, wow. Wow. But what was the response? You heard this passionate speech. You can imagine the passion and the emotion that they spoke with. And what was the people's response? But all the congregation bade stone, bade stone with them, bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will these people provoke me? How long will it be ere that they believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them? Can you imagine the emotion the God of Israel spoke to Moses with delivering this? How long, how long would they not believe in me? How long would they not have confidence in me? After I have repeatedly showed them and led them out of the land of Egypt. I have given them everything they need in order to be a successful nation, in order to live a successful, righteous life. And they still question. They still doubt. To this very day do we still doubt. That confidence. Now we know the end result was, hey, this generation will die off. Save the son of Caleb and Joshua. They will die off in the wilderness. Think about that. This generation will die off in the wilderness for their dis disbelief. Their lack of confidence. 40 years. 40 years. But it's something interesting, right? When we're reading and we're doing research, something interesting that jumped out to me, right? If we can, real quick, let's turn, let's go to Joshua chapter 2, real quick. Now remember, 40 years. In the beginning, hey, go and, spy, go and search out the land. These spies are going to come and search out the land, and we're going to come up with a plan, right? But we know that was altered because of the evil report, because of our lack of confidence in our God. Again, I'm going to skip around, but always for context, go back and read the entire chapter. And I'm going to start at verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into the harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. 
And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out whither the men went, I wot not, pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan and to the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were going out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and, all, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. I want to read that one more time. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. Wow. Wow. Think of that context. Their hearts melted. They had no courage in them. After what our God did to the Egyptians and after the, the confidence he had in us when we slew the kings of the Amorites. For 40 years, 40 years, we wasted in the wilderness. For 40 years, an entire generation had to die off because of our lack of confidence. 40 years. And we see now, when they enter the city, how that city had been afraid for 40 years. So if you will, let's go to Joshua chapter 4 to see if this was just a once-in-a-lifetime once thing. You have this person at a house saying, hey, we were fearful of your God, right? So Joshua chapter 4. And again, in your own time, I urge you to really read this entire chapter. I know we're jumping around for the sake of time and, and really to, to press the issue, but definitely, definitely go back and read. Joshua chapter 4. Let's start at uh, verse 15. And again, we're going in to subdue the land. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that they bear the ark of the testimony, that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of covenant of the Lord will come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up into the dry land that the waters of Jordan returned into their place and flowed all over his banks as they did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal and the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye, then, ye shall, then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were going over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye may fear the Lord your God forever. And it came to pass when the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan, westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was, that, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Hmm. Again, again, we see the confidence that our God is that he has in his plan. The same thing he did in Egypt to the Red Sea. The exact same thing he did to the Jordan River. So much so, but this time we had confidence in our God to go forth. And these kings 
was so afraid. We don't want to fight these guys. We don't want no problem with these guys. We know how powerful that God is. We know the magnitude of that God. Why don't we? Why don't we see the power in our God, the power in ourselves? Think about this for a second. 400 years, we were brutalized. We were brought over in the belly of ships. We were given the worst food. Of, of all the worst things that can happen, it happened to us, and we're still here. We are still here. How is that by any might but our God? How is that possible that you have terrorist groups, the KKK, you have Margaret Sanger, you have all these people who have sought to exterminate us, and we're still here today? Who is that but our God? What confidence could we possibly have in anything but our God? Even if you don't know our God, he still, still kept us so that he can be our God that one day, one day we will return unto him to serve him in spirit and in truth. Look at what our God has done for us. And how do we repay him constantly? By praise, singing praises to other gods. You know, not too long ago, the George Floyd verdict came down. And I admit I was very surprised considering that our history in this country and just the way that we know that it always goes. But I think the most disgusting act that I have ever seen was after this verdict was handed down. We were in the streets crying and singing praises unto Jesus. Couldn't comprehend it. I could not comprehend it. We're again, we're putting our hope into the God of our oppressor. We're putting our hope into the same God that these police officers serve who were shooting us down in the street. We're putting our confidence in the same system that was set up to keep us down. And we're crying, thanking their gods for a trinket. For a trinket, millions of black lives have been lost. I'm sorry, millions of Jacobites' lives have been lost. Millions. But it's good that we celebrated one victory. One victory for someone who will not spend more than 10 years behind bars. But for us to celebrate that one victory, in our minds, how do we rationalize this? For our, for our psyche, how do we sit at night and, and find hope in that. Again, I ask you, where's the confidence in our God? Where's the confidence in our God that we serve, that brought us through the Red Sea, that brought us through the Jordan River, that somehow in the midst of these 400 years in this country that has afflicted us since day one, that we still, we still somehow Keep turning to their gods. Unreal. Again, definition of insanity. Same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But as we just read in Joshua chapter 4, we see the confidence when we, we see the power when we have confidence in our God. We see the, the, the confidence, what, what we can accomplish when we have confidence in each other to do our job. Real quick, real quick, if we can, let's turn uh, to Esther chapter 4. Real quick. Book of Esther chapter 4. I have an old Bible. It's, well, I ain't going to say old. It's used. It's very used. It's very used. So my pages stick together a little bit. Now, Esther is one of those stories that's, that's, that, that's really, really celebrates our culture. And it really goes on to elaborate again who we are as a people. 
So real quick, I just want to just kind of just touch on the key point from Esther, the book of Esther. So we know there was this guy named Haman, and he sought to literally kill, kill everybody, kill all the Israelites. Had a decree signed by the king, go and kill all the Israelites. Right? How would you feel? Right? The act, again, the act of one affects the entire nation. The act of one. Mordecai refused to bow down to this man. And this man went and charged the king, hey, sign a decree that we can go and kill all of them. If you're the everyday Israelite sitting at home and there's a decree to kill, he's like, whoa, what's going on? What did I do? What did I do? But we have to understand the importance of one accord. Understanding what affects one of us affects all of us. Now I'm going to jump down to chapter 4. I'll start at verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every providence, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maid and her, chamber, and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved. And she sent Raymond to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he perceived it not. Then Esther for Hatash, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatash went forth to Mordecai to the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and all the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasures for the Jews to destroy them. And he, verse 8, and he gave them, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go and she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him and, and her people. And Hatash came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatash and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servant and the people of the king's providence do know that what whoever Whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come into the king and to the end of court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king's this 30 days. And when they told Mordecai Esther's words, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Again, reminding her, what affects one of us affects all of us. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. And fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. Wow. The confidence the confidence, but as you can see, it had to be built up as the previous speakers spoke about. That confidence just doesn't exist there. It has to be built up. This is why the God of Israel tells us over and over again, I'm the God that took you out of the land of Egypt to remind us to have that confidence in him that, hey, it'll be as long as you trust in me, it'll be okay. As long as you have the confidence in me to do what I tell you to do, it'll be okay. But the confidence in each other to gather all Israel together to fast and to pray. Think about that. As a nation on one accord, fasting and praying to our God. 
Think of how powerful that is. How powerful that is. Our prayer, our cries can reach the ears of our God together on one accord. How far removed are we from this? We're crying out into, again, those strange gods. Those strange gods that they burn on your lawn. That very same God that they burn on your lawn. But for you to make an excuse saying, hey, well, they're just, they just bad. Those are bad people, but the gods are all right. The gods have not done anything for you. Anything to take you away from this situation. The gods have no confidence in you. They don't care about you. Our God has that confidence in us to return unto him, to be a holy nation before him. And when we work together, what can't we accomplish? What can't we do? Confidence in the God of Israel is the key aspect in the lives of Israelites. Without it, there is no hope. Zero. Zero. Again, for time's sake, I'm kind of jump around. Uh, real quick, real quick. Um, let's jump to Daniel chapter 3. And again, for context. So, when Babylon came to subdue the land of Judah... They took with them the best of Israel, right? Sounds familiar. I know at least for me it sounds familiar. When I think about um, when I was a kid, I was in this program known as the, it was called the DSEG program. It's where they take certain, certain Jacobites from their school and place them into the school with, with um, a four-hour school, uh, mostly Europeans at this school, and they call it the DSEG program, right? Go figure. The thought was, at least it was told to me, that, hey, you're going to get a better education. But the actual action was, hey, you're coming in hands what we already have. We want to use your talents and your benefits. We want to use your talent for our benefit. And it reminds me so much when we talk about Daniel, right? And you'll have to turn. I'll just read real quick. Um, Daniel, Daniel won just to kind of set the stage. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Sinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke into Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, Children in whom there was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Wow. Wow. We want to take the best of your children. Not so that we can, teach them, we can treat them well. Not so that it'll... It, it'll just be one big happy family so that we can put our culture and our gods on them so that they can be a benefit to our nation. Again, does that sound familiar? Where have you heard that at? Where have you seen that at? So, again, for time's sake, let me jump to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. I'll start at verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and a breadth of six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So again, we see already, right, this graven image is getting ready to go up. And he's calling all the, the big shots of Babylon, all the big shots of Babylon. Come, come and behold this. Then in hurled cried aloud, to you is it commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, sack butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. 
And whosoever falleth not down and worship the same same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Right? We, familiar story, right? We've always been accused. Always been accused, right? When we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that's a problem for the other nations. That's a huge problem for the other nations. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, had made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and a dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship, that he shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not the gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast, ca what, that which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they, be brought, that they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I, which I have set up? To me, the nerve of you to ask me a question like that. You pilfered my, my land? You stolen the vessels? And you're going to ask me if, if I, I will bow down and worship your God? The nerve, the arrogance of that, right? Verse 15, now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Woo! The gall. Just to, just to, who, what God shall deliver you out of my hand? The nerve of this king. The nerve, the audacity of this king to make such a statement. To Israelites nonetheless. But, let's see their response. I'm sorry, now where was I? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Whew! Get goosebumps reading that. If it be so, we are not careful to answer you in this manner. I'm going to tell you like it is. We will not bow down and serve your gods. We will not do this thing that you have commanded all the land to do. And if we be cast into the fiery furnace, if our God save us, great. If not, so be it. But we will not serve your gods. Confidence. Confidence in the God of Israel. No matter what the outcome is, I will still have confidence in you. I will still follow you, even until my death. Confidence. True confidence. Not just going around saying, I have confidence in my God. In the face of danger to the king, to the highest authority in the land. That if it be so, then it just be so. Now I want to skip down again for time's sake. To, let me jump to... Verse 27. And the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, for the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, 
Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servant that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they, that they may not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amidst the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Confidence in the God of Israel. They had no idea how this was going to go. No clue how it was going to go. But it, the confidence they had made it so that a king sent a decree out that any manner, anything, anybody speak ill of their God, their house be made a dunghill. They should be cut into pieces. Whew. What God, again. What, what a God. What a God. What level of confidence do we see we can accomplish when we have confidence in our God? Do we see what we can do when... We don't worry about the outcome. We just do what we're supposed to do. We keep moving forward. Who cares what your friends think? Who cares what your family thinks? Who cares what the world thinks? You just keep moving forward to do what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Regardless if the outcome is something you want. But confidence is in, in the God of Israel will yield favorable results every time. Every single time. I have a cue that I'm, I'm running out of time. That I, I'm running out of time. I, I have to get to one last story. One, one last story. Again, if we can, let's, let's turn to Joshua chapter 10. And I know I'm jumping all over, but I really, really want to drive the point home of confidence in the God of Israel. We have to have confidence in the God of Israel. But I ask you, what is confidence in the God of Israel if he doesn't have the confidence in us to do that of, which, of what he commands us to do? How can he move forward if there's no confidence? How can he come and restore us if there's no confidence in, him, in us? If he cannot have confidence in us, then what can, what can be done? But when we do have that confidence, when we do serve our God, what can be accomplished? Again, Joshua chapter 10. Now it came to pass. Actually, I'll, 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 I'll skip around for time's sake. Again, context, always go back and read. Context, we're, we're, we're still subduing the land. And right now, we're, we're battling, and we're, we're, in, alleg we're in allegiance with, with Gibeon. And they come to Joshua and say, hey, Joshua, we need your help. These five kings have set themselves against us, and we need your help in order to fight against these kings since we made an allegiance with you guys. They're coming, and they're trying to subdue us. So I jump down to verse 6. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war, with him all of the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear, fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter of Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Haran and smote them to Azazel. Azekah and to Makeda. And it came to pass that they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Haran that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them into Azekah and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of, of Ajalon, 
and the moon and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. The sun stood still. When we talk about confidence, when we talk about confidence in each other, confidence in ourselves, confidence into the God of Israel, and when, we, when he has confidence in us, what are we able to accomplish? What power do we have to stop the sun from going down? What nation on this earth has that God? What nation on this earth has a God that will stop the sun from going down? Verse 14, and there was no day like this before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. There was no day that the God of Israel no other day the God of Israel hearkened unto the voice of an Israelite to stop the sun from going down. That's the confidence I want to have. That's the confidence I have in my God. That every single day we do those self-checks to make sure I have confidence in my God, that he will have confidence in me. To put the spirit of truth in us so that we may continue to go and teach all nations about the glory and the might of our God and this truth to live righteous lives, to be the greatest nation on this earth, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation unto God. I ask you again, what nation, uh, what other nation has that God? to have confidence in him, that he will do whatever it takes for us to return unto him, to do, to do the work he set before us to be a holy nation unto him. Brethren and guests, I thank you for your time. I thank you for staying and listening. I pray, pray that you learn something this evening and that you will continue on in your search to have confidence in the God of Israel. With that, I bid you peace. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blood, son, this is all heart. Straight from the heart. El Shadrach said that we were in the secret chambers, secret chambers of the holy chariot riders. Holy chariot riders. And we've passed through the gates yeah. of the seven candlesticks. Seven candlesticks. It's brotherhood. Forever. Oh, I remember back in the days when people were afraid it was I who said, send me. Then, Lord, you blessed my soul and turned me into gold, made me more than most men could be. Oh, I remember way back then when you looked for men, your oil was there upon me. So I lift my hands to the sky, eyes open wide, and give my praises to thee. Preach to the last man, you would think to read the Bible, my mission in the